Hello, and welcome to Pathway Online. We're so glad you could be with us here today. No matter where you are or how you might be watching, please join me now in singing out to our amazing Heavenly Father.
was going down Thought it was for the count Then I found your love I had wandered off Thought I had gone too far There I found your love Fear I used to know Can't stop me anymore Cause I found your love When I feel alone I have a place to go Hello again, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Steve, and it's so good to be with you. Now, before we go back to singing, I've got a question for you. Can you imagine some of today's top communicators visiting your home to lead a Bible study? What if you could enjoy a lesson on humility or biblical wisdom while you're on the treadmill at the gym? Pathway family, this digital dream is now a reality. And best of all, it's absolutely free. It's called Right Now Media. And this platform features a library of more than 20,000 teaching videos from Matt Chandler, Francis Chan, Jenny Allen, and many, many more. So if you haven't taken advantage of this incredible resource, today would be a great day to jump in. You can create an account on our website by writing your email address on your Connect card along with the words Right Now Media. And one more thing, if you're newer to Pathway and you'd like to learn more about who we are and what we offer, then we'd love to meet you at our Newcomers Luncheon on Sunday, June 5th. 
We'll gather in the cafe right after our second service and you can enjoy a free meal, some relaxing conversation, and ask us anything about our church. Okay, let's once again prepare our hearts as we continue to sing songs of praise and worship to our Heavenly Father.
Jesus, we bring you all of the praise and glory and honor today because your name is the only one that is worthy of it. We get caught up sometimes in something that we thought we've done, something that we thought we had control over, something that we thought we would put our name on, but it's all yours. Our world is yours. Every breath that you give us comes directly from an outflowing of your grace. We celebrate your perfect love that, as we sang before, cannot be contained, cannot be changed, cannot be overwhelmed by anything that we face. Your love remains faithful. And I ask now that your word would come and change us, come and convict us, come and bring us peace, bring us joy, bring us a glimpse of that love. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Well, it is a delight to welcome all of you wherever you're listening in today. For those of you in the room live here with me, welcome to you. Glad to see you and those of you online or on one of our campuses, maybe our Moon Campus or in our classic venue, wherever you're checking this out, welcome. Good to have you here. I am super excited about the text that I get to take us into today. And uh, I'm all also, though, I got to tell you, still kind of excited just in the follow-up of where we were last weekend as we had our grand Easter weekend celebration together. Um, I just had a marvelous time. I hope you did also. We had our Good Friday service where services where we had uh, the opportunity to take a look at the seven last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. We had seven different speakers, each one of them taking one of those words, and everyone had just something really stunning to, to share in that. We shared communion with one another. It was just a special time as a family here as we worshiped and as we celebrated what Jesus has done on our behalf, and then our Easter services with the worship, and, and we had a good time with that, and I think, yeah, there that kind of a reminder of uh, some of what we did with the services and and uh, the gospel went out and and some people came to faith in Jesus Christ and and we had about 25 baptisms through the weekend as well and just to listen to the testimonies of the folks who were going through the waters of baptism was genuinely inspiring to me I mean I've got to tell you that from the bottom of my heart and if you were here you know what we're talking about and uh, I got to go to all of the services and hear all of them and uh, so maybe you didn't have that opportunity but it was really quite uh, stunning to to listen to the way that God is working. And I walked away from that weekend just really enthused and excited about the things that are going on in people's lives here at Pathway. And then uh, the rest of that day kind of held something else that was a bit different for me and Carolyn. We actually got on a plane um, later in the day on Easter and we flew to Boston. And on Monday, I ran the Boston Marathon. And uh, so that was pretty awesome. Oh, you don't... Okay. See, that's why I don't usually mention doing those sorts of things, and uh, I was reluctant to do that today, but thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, this was this year's race, and that's the finish line that you can see right there, and, and it was a magnificent time. It was really a, a spectacular experience to be able to do that, and, and the crowds are amazing, and they're all along the course, and they're cheering you on and trying to encourage you toward the finish line. Though some of their signs didn't necessarily suggest that they were encouraging you that much, and I don't know if you've run a marathon or some of these races, you know that some of the signs aren't always all that encouraging. So some of the ones that you might see along the route were things like this, worst parade ever. You know, and if you're looking on it, it would be a pretty bad parade if that's what you were expecting. Or uh, here was another one. Uh, you could have chosen chess. You didn't have to be out there, out there running. And uh, another one that you'll see in marathons uh, that are out there for these, you know, poor souls who are running all these miles, something like this. Uh, getting up to make this sign uh, wasn't easy either. He says, <laughs> like, like, that was a, like that was a big deal. But I think maybe one of the best that sort of just sums the whole thing up is this one, just a single word, why? <laughs> why are you doing that to yourself? And I got to tell you, there are a couple of miles at least in, in every race where you're, it's like, 
That, exactly. Why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through all of this? But it was a, it was a pretty amazing experience, and, and uh, I actually enjoyed my time very much in, uh, in doing that. And there's something very unusual about it, because you get in, in these races, and you're running along, and the, the circumstance is you're, you're really not racing against the other people that you're in the race with. You're, you're really kind of all there for one another and with one another, and you're all doing the same thing, and you're all kind of running more against the clock, at least the, the part of the field that I'm in. I'm not with the Kenyans. Um, you know, it, you're, you're just kind of, you're all going the same distance, and you're all fighting through it together, and you're all experiencing the same pain and the same hills, and Heartbreak Hill is just as long and just as steep for everybody, and, and just the fact that you're all in in this together, which is what we're talking about today, that you're all in, that we're all in this together, is something that just kind of encourages you to take one step and then the next one and keep you moving along. Now, I had some extra encouragement in this year's race. In fact, I have in all of my races because I have the best support system ever in my family. They come to all of the races and they love to be there. And uh, this was us on one of the streets there in downtown Boston, and and uh, they're always there and. Their goal is to see me and encourage me at as many stops or as many places as they possibly can along the route. Their record was seeing me eight times um, in, in a race. Actually, that was just in last year's race. Um, but they were going to try to beat that this year. So they got a car, and uh, I start on the race, and they come out near the beginning of the race, and they see me once there, and then they run, and they get in the car, and they speed ahead a few miles and park wherever they can, usually legally, and uh, they, then they run to the race route, however far that is from where they could find parking, and they wait, and, and I come by, and then they run back to the car, and they speed ahead a little bit, and they run to the race route, and they see me, and, and they just do that for the whole 26 point two miles. This year uh, on Monday, they set a brand new record. They saw me nine different times in, uh, in those 26 miles. I think they ran further than I ran uh, on, uh, in, in following me along on that race. But it uh, made all the difference in the world to me to sort of have this sense of we're in this together and we're getting it done. And just knowing that they were coming or that I would be seeing them soon just kind of kept me going along the way as well. And I also just want to take a moment to thank those of you who were, who were cheering me on from afar, and I thank you for your well wishes and your interest and, and your congratulations that you've offered, and it was, uh, it was quite the experience, and, and uh, I'm just glad to be able to share uh, at least a little bit of it with you. But this whole idea of being all in it together is something that, that you really sense this camaraderie, and you get to the finish line, and it's like everybody's really emotional, and you're hugging people you've never met in your life because you've just done this together, and I can't even explain the emotion of it, but there's something about being in circumstances together, side by side with people, especially when it's something that is, is traumatic or difficult or significant. And, and that's exactly what we're going to see today and why it came to my mind in the first place and why I, I take the time to share all of that with you. We're going to see something today that has something to do with being all together in a circumstance. And, and there's actually multiple situations. And the first one, as we get started, is not very positive at all. In fact, it's incredibly incredibly negative. And then we kind of turn a corner and we see that it turns positive. And I'm looking forward to explaining that to you. It's the passage we've come to as we continue on in our study through the book of Romans, which we're calling Romans, Grace Changes Everything. Grace Changes Everything everything. It's what we are talking about. And the specific passage that we come to today is Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12, we're going to cover the rest of the, this chapter in Romans. If you want to use your scripture journal, you can you find it there on page 24. Just open to Romans 5, 12, and you'll find that that is page 24. And so that's where we're going to be today. We're going to take our, our look through this. And I feel like every week when I stand up here, it's like I could say, all right, now this is one of Paul's weighty passages in Romans. And it's like every, every week I could say that because every week is pretty significant and pretty deep and, and theological, but still very practical. And we're going to see both of that as we make our way through this. So a few different things that I want to highlight as it comes to things that we all have in common or that we're all in together. And the first thing that he talks about is the curse extended. 
All right, the curse extended is where this gets going. The curse in view here has to do with the origin of sin and the effects of sin on mankind. This is a passage dealing with a somewhat complicated doctrine called original sin. All right, you've probably heard that before. Maybe you aren't completely sure exactly where that comes from or what all is entailed. Well, just to be clear, original sin is not talking about you committing a sin that nobody's ever thought of before. All right, so it's your original sin, all right? This is not you driving to Pittsburgh on an expired license in a stolen car, and while you're doing it, you're texting while you're driving, you're texting your drug dealer to tell him to double your amount so you can sell more to the nursing home and lie about it to your bookie, all right? That's not what this, that is an original sin. Nobody probably before has ever done quite that combination of a sin, but that is not original sin, as in the theology or the doctrine. Original sin, and I, we can define this for you here, and I'll try to leave this up here long enough so you can take this down. Original sin is the inherent sin nature all mankind possesses as transmitted from Adam to all humans as a consequence of the fall. All right, there's our definition. The inherent sin nature all mankind possesses is transmitted from Adam to all humans as a consequence of the fall. God was very, very clear in the Garden of Eden that Adam was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was very clear what he was supposed to do, what he was not supposed to do, yet Adam defied. And that was the sin. That was referred to or is referred to as the fall of mankind into sin. This is the world's first sin. And that sin wasn't just something that Adam did that all of a sudden there are problems with Adam's circumstance before God, but rather that that sin was transmitted to all humanity. All humanity down through time, including us. Every one of us is included in that original, that first sin. That's what the doctrine of original sin is telling us about. It creates a separation. It, was a, it wasn't just a curse on Adam. It was a curse extended to all the rest of us as well. Now, this is specifically what Paul is talking about starting in verse 12. As our passage gets rolling, if you look at it, he writes, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, that's the consequence, and so death spread to all men because all sin. That was the curse extended. That's a pretty ominous verse, to say the least, and it all comes through the sin of Adam there in the garden. And now you might be sitting back and you might be thinking what a lot of people think about this, and that is, that's not fair. I mean, it's not fair that there is one person who should sin, and it should be his problem, not all the rest of our problem. And so people who object against this doctrine speak to it on that basis, that it's not right that I would be included in what somebody else chose or what their decision was. And the more individualistic a nation or an era is, the more that they have objection to this particular doctrine. And I can hardly think of any more individualistic nation or era or place or time than 21st century America. I think we are the most individualistic of, of any nation in any time that has ever existed before. You can go to other places in the world today and you won't find that same sort of individual, individualistic sort of spirit and, and nature. It's much more of a, of a common federal understanding of the way that people engage and interact and are responsible with one another. We don't like the idea that we should have to be subject to the consequences of somebody else's actions. I mean, this is so much the case. I can remember all the way back to when I was in school, which was a long time ago now. I can remember all the way back to one particular time when we were supposed to go on a field trip as a class. But one of the kids in the class got in a fight with another kid the day before. And so the teacher's punishment was that nobody in the class could go on the field trip. And that just did not seem fair to us at all, that just these two kids were fighting and this should be the consequence for all the rest. I mean, this is back in the day when you only got one field trip a year. And, you know, it was usually like to the, to the pig pen down at the neighbor's farm or something is pretty much for the extent of, and we loved it. I mean, today go, kids go on field trips to Europe. You know, it's, it's, it's a different circumstance, and you know that that's the case. So even missing out on a trip to the sewage treatment plant because of somebody else's sin or actions seems so very unfair to 
us, and understandably so. So this idea that Adam's sin has made me guilty is something that we would naturally cry unfair to as well. And the more individualistic we are, the more that we feel that, and I feel that, and you probably do too. And that's not to say, though, that we don't have circumstances where we can sit, continue to see this idea of a representative head that is influencing all the rest of us. We still see that today. Now, when it happens to be working in our positive favor, we don't tend to complain about it, but it's still there. You might think of it um, in this context. It wasn't that long ago that we were watching the Winter Olympics. And you might have missed a night of coverage. And so you go into work the next day and you say, hey, how did it go with the, with the men's figure skating? Who, who won all of that? And uh, your coworker just says back to you, we did. We did. Well, it was Nathan Chen who won it. He's the only one who got the medal. He's the only one who can hang it around his neck. Yet we feel we won the medal because he was a representative of our nation. And so we feel included in that, and we like it that way because there's something that we won even though we didn't have anything to do with it at all. Or if President Zelensky is able to negotiate peace, peace with Russia, all Ukraine gets peace. Each individual doesn't need to go and negotiate their own peace one by one so that they get it. He is a representative head representing the whole of the nation and what he does impacts. And you can see that over and over and over again. We could come up with examples all night long of how that is the case. But I understand the objection that comes when it comes to this issue of sin or something negative that comes our way. We're happy to take the positive but sometimes with the positive comes the negative. And interestingly enough, in this passage, taking the negative is going to turn positive. And I'll show you that here in just a minute. But I understand the objection that Adam's sin would be transferred to all the rest of us. But there are some other factors that we need to kind of add in here so that we can see it's a little bit more understandable, maybe even justifiable as we go. For instance, when God made Adam our representative, he knew that if we had been the ones who was there facing that circumstance, and in that context, we almost certainly would have made the exact same decision or something that was very similar or fallen into our own trap, even if it hadn't been exactly that, our own trap soon enough. You can't say that if you were there that you wouldn't have sinned, that you would have been a better representative for all of mankind if you'd have been there because you would have made a different choice so there never would have been any sin that entered into the world. Because you taking on that perspective is suggesting that, well, well you know better than what God knew and God putting Adam Adam there in the garden, and that basically is you saying that you know better with God, which is essentially what Adam's sin was. And so it's ironic that just by suggesting that we should have been the one there instead, or that it's, it's, the irony is that we are essentially condemning ourselves in the very argument against the fact that we ought to be condemned. Even if you weren't there to make your own choice. You have made Adam's choice over and over again in your life. You've elevated yourself over God. You have chosen to live out your will over against what God has indicated that his will would be for you as one who has been made in his image and he has created a purpose for your life and a will that he has for you to do. And you resisting all of that is the same thing that Adam was doing. And so we ourselves have entered into the very same circumstance. We're not ones who would have done better by being there ourselves. And we need to understand that. This is impossible to deny, actually, because we see sin in us and around us every single day. In fact, I think the only, the only people who could be even possibly suggest or object to the idea of original sin would be someone who's never had kids, right? Because you have kids, you know that there is sin in the world, there's no doubt. As J.D. Greer says, no kid has ever had to be sent to sin camp to, to, learn how to, to learn how to do it or to selfishness seminars. No toddler has ever walked up to his parents and said, you know what, Mom and Dad? I haven't been that good today, so I'm going to go put myself in timeout so I can just think about my actions for a while. And I'm just going to stay in there till you, you decide to come and let me out. And you guys just go, you have a good time while I'm in timeout. That has never happened and never will happen in the history of the world. That's just not the way that it operates. I'm convinced that every theological textbook should say, toddlers prove original sin. And it should just be stated right there. 
Or commentator Tony Morita quotes this from a secular child psychologist, his name's Burton White, regarding his research on early childhood development. Here's what he says. He says, from 15 to 16 months on, as his self-awareness becomes more substantial, something in his nature we don't fully understand will lead him to deliberately try each of these forbidden activities. In other words, he will begin systematically to challenge the authority of the adults he lives with. Resistance to simple requests become very common at this time. And if there is more than one child around, this can be a low point in the parenting experience. (laughs) <laughs> no kidding. A low point in the parenting experience. Yeah, like questioning whether or why you ever became a parent in the first place is what that can be. But what's interesting is, the, is that little phrase he said earlier on. If we go back to it, you can, you can see it here. He says, something in his nature we don't fully understand. Well, the fact of the matter is we do understand that something that is in his nature because the scriptures have told us exactly what that is. We're descendants of Adam. And because of Adam's sin, that sin has been infused on us so that we all have a sin nature as well. And it starts to come out and we start to see it and it just continues to come out all the way through our life. And we have Adam to thank originally for that, but we have ourselves to thank because we would have done exactly the same thing if we had been in his situation. That's what we're talking about. And then as Paul goes on here, he adds some parenthetical thoughts. we got verse 12. It takes a lot to set up and talk about verse 12. Then he adds something a little bit parenthetical here in verses 13 and 14, which can be a little confusing, so I'm just going to try to unpack it as we go. So let's look at each of these phrases. He writes, beginning in verse 13, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. Okay, the law was given to Moses, right? We've talked about this before. Well, Adam came a long time before Moses. So there's a long time that exists in there where the law wasn't present to suggest to people, here's exactly the way, specifically the way, that God would have you to live. And so there's this period of time that we don't know exactly how God would desire for us to live. So it's not the law that says that sin has come into the world. It is what Adam has done in the garden that brings sin into the world. And he says here that sin was in the world before the law was given. So it's just suggesting to us that yes, sin does start with Adam and it's carrying on through that point or through that period of time. He goes on, but sin is not counted where there is no law. We'll come back to that part. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. The consequences of sin were not worse once the law was given. It's through that same period of time that death was reigning because of sin, because of Adam's sin and that which continued on from that point. Even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. Before the law, God's specific will for people's behavior wasn't completely known because we don't have the law. But Adam is one who has jumped into his sin here, and he's the exception to all of that because God told Adam and Eve exactly what his will was for them in the garden. So they know. They have specifics. Everybody in between is still sinning, and we can see how and and why here as we go on. Back to this little phrase in verse 13, though. Oh, wait wait a second. Right there at the end of verse 14 says, who was the type of the one who was to come. We're coming back to that also. But let's first of all go back to this little phrase in verse 13. It says, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Now, what do you suppose that means? Paul is saying that God isn't holding people accountable for something that they didn't know. He's saying these people between Adam and between Moses before the law comes, he says, I'm not holding them accountable for the law because the law hasn't yet been given. And so there's a certain extra sort of grace that is being provided there, but it doesn't mean that they could just go and live any way that they wanted because we've already seen in Romans that the law of God is already written on our hearts, not the specific law of Moses, just the law of God, the fact that he is present, the fact that that we can recognize and see him through the things that he has made tell us that God is present, and it tells us something about his nature and his character, and it helps us to understand some of how it is that he would have us to 
live. We don't have his specific will, and so there's no accountability to the specific law that God ultimately will give, but there is a responsibility to the generalities of who God is and what he has made and that he is worthy of worship and, and on and on. That has implications in a number of ways, specifically as we think about children who are not able up until a certain point of development mentally to perceive the things that are true about God. They don't have that ability. So young children or um, the unborn or those who perhaps have been aborted, these are ones who don't have the ability yet to have that perception and understanding of God. And so what Paul seems to be indicating here is that they won't be held responsible for things that they couldn't know. They will simply be recipients of the grace of God through the work that Jesus has done through his blood on the cross should they die before that point in time comes. And that then ends this parenthesis. And the same thing, I should say, would also be true in certain cases of of mental challenges that uh, some individuals have for the same reason, that they don't have the ability to perceive, depending on what their circumstance is, things that are true about God. So it just goes to answer some of that question as to what happens for those who die before they even really have the opportunity. So that ends the parentheses here, verses 13 and 14, and takes us back to how Adam is now a representative and how his sin has been passed down to the rest of us. We've seen that the curse is extended. That's where he gets started. Now he goes on. There's another piece to this as well, and that is, in, in turning a corner here, he talks about the gift provided. Verse 14 ended by saying that Adam is a type a type. It's a theological word. And as such, he's pointing the way to something or someone else. That's how a type works. Let me define this for you. A type is this. It's a person or object in the Old Testament that foreshadows or points to a person or object in the New Testament. Someone, something in the Old Testament that is foreshadowing, that's pointing to, saying, let this be something that helps you to gain an understanding of that which is coming into the future. And that's what we have going on here. Verse 15 shows us what Adam is pointing to. Adam is the type. What is it that he's pointing to in the New Testament? Well, part of it is this gift that is provided. Paul writes, verse 15, but look at all the gifts he's talking about here. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, Adam's, Much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. All right, what's that talking about? Well, Adam is a type pointing to Jesus, and their primary similarity here is the fact that both of them are representatives of mankind. And this is where we come to see that the fact that we're represented by Adam all by one is going to actually come back into our favor as we can all be represented again by one, only this time the one he's talking about here in 15 through 19, the gift that is provided, is Jesus. He is the one that Adam ultimately is pointing to. And sometimes in the Scriptures, Adam or Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. All right, that's just indicating the fact that Adam's the type and and Jesus is the antitype. That's what the one in the New Testament is typically referred to as. And so what we have here is this idea that we are able to be represented by an individual or by one for the whole, which provides this for us very well because now Jesus can represent us as one for the whole entity as well himself. What we see in Adam when he came into the world and disobey God, he brought a curse. Jesus, the second Adam, comes into the world and obeys God so that he might dismantle the curse. If it weren't this way, you and I would all be responsible, if it weren't for Jesus, we'd all be responsible for going and earning our own forgiveness from our sin. And we cannot do that. We're not able to atone for our own sin. There's only one who could do that, and that was Jesus. And if it wasn't that we could be represented by the one man negatively, Adam, then we couldn't be represented by simply one 
one, Jesus, either. And so while Adam looks very negative to us as we think about the extent of, of original sin that falls down to all the rest of us, it ends up being a positive that we can be represented by one and that Jesus came into our world to take care of that for us on the cross. And so ultimately it brings us good news, what seems like bad news at the start. Jesus came to undo the effects of the fall and provide the gift of life. Verse 18 just kind of says it again in another way. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to right justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, Adam's, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. All right, you see what's going on here? This is ultimately good news. And uh, there are some who wonder in those verses that we just read because of Paul's language. He says that there's justification and life for all men. They wonder, well, is, is this teaching then universal salvation? Is he teaching that all people then are going to be saved? And the answer is clearly no, because the Scriptures tell us again and again and again how it is that we come into accepting and receiving the gift of God's grace. We've seen it many different places. We've already seen it many times in Romans. We've talked about a future time that's coming in Romans that uh, it comes from Romans chapter 10. I'm going to quote it again for you because it speaks right into this situation. It says there, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It goes on, says, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. That is abundantly clear. And one of the principles of interpretation is if there's anything that is a little bit gray or a little bit difficult to understand, and in Romans 5 you might put in that, not that it's, not that it's unclear or not that it's wrong, it's just that it's not stated quite as plainly as it is in Romans 10. One of the principles of interpretation is you always interpret the less clear by the more clear, by the clearer. So in this case, we use Romans 10 and many, many other passages to interpret Romans 5 so that we understand that it's not at all that he's teaching universal salvation. Salvation comes as we bow our knee to Jesus Christ, as we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. It's not just something that is provided for everyone universally. All right? Important that we would understand that. So Paul's point is coming into pretty sharp focus here. We, we saw first the curse extended as we saw Adam's sin and how it impacted the whole human race. Then we saw the gift extended and how Jesus' love and Jesus' provision impacts also the whole human race, that we have the ability to turn our lives to Jesus. We have that opening, that open door that we can walk through. And then there's one last piece that Paul adds to wrap up his thoughts. And we see it in the grace received. This is the last piece, the grace received. All along, Paul has been pointing us in the direction of grace. It is a grace that God offers us through Jesus, who is the second Adam. And it is a grace that changes everything. Everything. We have a sin nature. We have the sin of Adam that has brought a curse on our lives. And we have participated in that through our own sin, and we're hopeless apart from the work of the second Adam, Jesus, who came to provide us his grace, and that grace changes everything because it takes us from a place of deserving death to a place of having life and justification offered in our direction. Here's the way that Paul says it in our context here, verse 20, going on. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Starts there in verse 20. The way that the law increases the trespass, there as it begins in verse 20, is that it points out the presence of sin, just in case you forgot. <laughs> It's saying the law comes along and it points out the fact that this is what God's standard would be for us and we're not living up to it, so it simply indicates to us the, the extent of our need. That's what he is saying here. But his purpose is to highlight that God's grace is greater than our sin. That's why he brings it up. If you grew up with hymns, you might be very familiar with that chorus. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Verse 20, grace that is greater than all my sin. You will never overwhelm or bury God's grace, regardless of how high your sin is piled. God's grace reaches higher. 
and can cover it all. It's a beautiful statement. Verse 20 again says, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. If you need a memory verse, (laughs) right there. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Paul goes to great lengths to tell us about these two Adams. Whether or not you've really ever thought about it before, you're connected to one of them. The first Adam. In your sin, it's simply a part of who you are. It is part of your nature. But you can take that Adam off the driver's seat in your life and replace him with the second Adam. You didn't have a choice about the first Adam. You just got it. It was there when you were born. But you do have to make a choice about the second Adam. Whether or not you are going to invite him to come and bring the effects that he provided on your behalf and make it effective in your life. And you do that by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's how it's done. And so that's what Paul is trying to help us to understand this idea that we were in Adam, that we were Adam essentially. And when he sins, we sinned right along with him. And even if we hadn't, even if we weren't there at the time, and we weren't, we were in that sin, and we would have committed it in exactly same, the same way. It's, there's no point in spending your energy and effort trying to cry out it's unfair. Spend your energy and your effort thanking Jesus for the fact that he undid that curse and provided grace in its place through Jesus Christ who became our representative when he went to the cross. That's what Paul wants us to understand. And that's how Paul wants us to respond. And so I pray that that is what your response would be, recognizing the grace that God has provided, a grace that changes everything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, deep weighty stuff here maybe we've come at this and many people have and and having difficulty understanding the nature or the reason and and the reasoning and the rationale behind original sin and and what that's all about and and how we can be held culpable for the action of somebody else but lord paul's helped us to understand here not only the nature of how we very much are incorporated in and our thoughts and our minds and our actions would be very much the same if we had been there in the garden instead of Adam. So there's no reason to spend our time and our energy suggesting how unfair that was because we have committed all the same sins ourselves. So instead of spending our time concerned and worried about that, we should instead be thankful that while it looks negative that we had one whose sin infected all, that we also now have one whose righteousness has the ability to infect all. And we thank you for your son, Jesus. And we thank you for what he has done on the cross to take that sin nature and to set it aside so that we might instead allow the second Adam, Jesus, to reign in our lives, to overcome that sin, to give us the ability that when the sins come up, maybe day by day, that we would confess those sins and that we would find ourselves right with you. Father, we thank you for your grace, a grace that has changed everything. But Lord, help us to not be people who take this for granted. Help us to not be the people that just walk off and say, well, God's grace is sufficient, and so I can do what I feel like doing. No, we're simply indicating there that the significance of what Jesus has done probably hasn't actually impacted our heart, if we can live that callously. So Lord, in these moments, for any who have yet to put their faith and their trust in you, I just pray that we would take seriously this opportunity, this moment to confess our sin, to seek your forgiveness and put our faith and trust in you. That's, Lord, that's what you've been leading us to each and every week, and it's been so encouraging to see people take that step and then testify to the step they've taken as they've gone through baptism or in, in other means. And Lord, I just pray that you continue to do a work in our hearts. Lord, conform us more and more to your image, we pray. In the name of Jesus. 
Amen. Thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon on campus or right here online. Have a wonderful week, everybody.